Good morning, West USA. Welcome to another edition of our uh, Tuesday morning webinar. We appreciate uh, you joining us as always. As I'm just uh, getting a little, uh, little finger trigger happy there on yeah. the, on our slides. Um, yeah. But as always, we're here each and every Tuesday morning to help you navigate uh, the tipsy topsy or topsy tivy or whatever. whatever. So we're not. Oh, that one too. Thanks, Mick. <laughs> Topsy turvy uh, market, as we've been known as the uh, the real estate market. But anyways, we're here to help you increase your uh, bottom line. Appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, a little sneak peek of what we got coming up today. Uh, we got, of course, Todd Menard here to give us a look at the numbers. We got Mick Menard. He's back for the Booksman Baker team. Gonna we're gonna continue, Todd, our conversation on traits of highly successful agents. Part ado, mm. and then we got American Titles. Bill Cope. He's here. He's gonna talk to us about Burp Dog. Nice. This is great because we don't really know much about FERPA. It's, what is that? I don't know. Okay. We're going to find out. That's why we got Bill here. And then, uh, of course, we got to do the, don't do that with Bob, but we don't have Bob. So Bob's not here today. Yes. So, yeah. You know, anyways. Um, and if you got any questions, uh, have any, uh, would like copies of the slides, have any suggestions of any topics that you would like us to cover, please feel free to email us at webinar at westusa.com and uh, we will get that to you as soon as we can. All right, Todd, what do we got cooking with the numbers? Well, Mike, we're sitting at 54 days closed on market, our 2.29 current month supply, uh, eating up about 44%, 43.63% of our inventory on a monthly basis, 521 our average list price, and 313 for the average sale price. 98.7 uh, list price to sale price retention. That's a good number. We're happy to see that. Um, so taking a look at the active inventory. Hey, this is nice. You're sitting next to me now with yeah, the new don't get gigs. You can do it. your own slides. <laughs> oh, this is great. I'm going to go, I'm going to go get, grab an egg McMuffin <laughs> and a cup of coffee. I'll be back in a while. Active inventory sitting at 16,000, over 16,000. But as you can tell over the last couple of months, a couple of weeks anyway, we'll, we'll discuss in a little bit. That hasn't been moving too, too much. Pending at 4844 and closed units for the month at 4595. Um, taking a look at the new listings, we took 1987 listings this past week. That's a little lower than normal. We certainly like to see that over 2000, over 2500, Mike, if we can. Uh, of course, days on market for the entire inventory is 170 days and closed is 54. Basically, the difference is not just the difference between a property being ready, moving ready, um, staged properly. Difference is just what portion of the marketplace is actually selling. And again, this tells you down here in the lower right hand side, under 500,000 still commands about 74% of the entire MLS inventory. Um, you can even take a look at the units and see exactly how many units are representative of each price range. Uh, over 500 and under a million is sitting at about 17 and a half percent of the total inventory. And then ironically, uh, over a million is half of that, which is at 8.7. Um, and you can see further to the right, the average days on market for that active inventory, about 76 days for those under 500,000, 123 under a million and 220 over. So how's it look across the board? Remember this sheet, uh, if you would like any kind of assistance in understanding how to read these two sheets over the last two months, we provided in West words an explanation of how to uh, explain this sheet to your client and exactly what each of the numbers mean. So please refer to that. Um, looking across the top, you can see last week we were at 2011, uh, new listings taken two weeks ago, excuse me, and this past week we were at 1987. Um, active inventory at 1632 last week, uh, 1663 currently taking a look at our UCB pending. Uh, 4844, if you slide your eyes across to the right, we've been a year ago as high as 7700, uh, almost during the same time frame. So 4800, again, is, is not that very many properties in escrow, uh, almost half, uh, to be honest. Uh, but we are still seeing, and this is kind of the dichotomy or the, the anomaly that's going on in the marketplace, is the supply and demand laws are a little off. Um, normally, you'd see lower lower pending units. You'd imagine that, of course, that means lower closed units. However, uh, you know we were at we've been up consistently almost every month except for June uh, this year. We've been somewhere between five to ten, five to eleven percent ahead of last year as far as unit closings, unit sales are concerned. Um, so again, a little bit of anomaly. Currently, uh, month to date, we're sitting at forty two hundred ninety five, which is about five percent behind last year. 
Taking a look at stats down at the bottom, we have, uh, as we said, 2.45 last week as far as month supplies concerned. A little, little more brisk this week at 2.29. Uh, 46% of the inventory is getting eaten up. Our price ranges are running somewhere between 100, uh, 521,000, excuse me, and 540, as you can see to the right. We've been as high as about 560,000 uh, so far year to date. But again, this is showing that although there could be peaks and valleys, you could have one week where more homes in the 500,000 or a million dollar range are selling. Um, but what you're actually seeing here is that there's not all that much pressure might be put on the sale prices. And that's kind of unusual, uh, you know, in the fact when you have low inventory, usually low inventory, they, they push the prices up. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then finally down here, days on market, uh, we've seen a consistent from 159 all the way up to pushing now to 170. Uh, certainly uh, the, the Upper end of the market is still uh, starting to become a little more brisk, but it's still lagging behind, obviously, the lower price points. And again, as long as we're somewhere between 97.8, 98% as far as list price, Mike, we're doing really good as far as retention is concerned. All right, perfect. And as always, um, I don't have my bell here, so but Ding. if you would like copies of the slides, hold on. Uh, Sarah's bringing the bell here. we got a bell coming. She's running oh, over here. So go. nice. Oh, oh, there back. you go. If you like copies of the slides, you can find them on the dashboard. Also, if you'd like to just uh, print these out, laminate them, they may make a great uh, little placemats for That's your nice. children and grandkids. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, <laughs> you can even have them color in the squares. <laughs> or maybe use them in a presentation. There you go. Go figure. All right, Mick. Uh, we have Mick from the Bookspan Baker team at Fairway Independent Mortgage. Mick, uh, welcome back. Thank and, you so much. Uh, thanks for being here. Thank you. Well, glad to be here. Uh, rates are hanging in there. Uh, there for a couple of weeks. We were up pushing over five, and now we're back down again. Uh, the, a little bit of an anomaly this past week, as you can see, Jumbo is actually slightly lower than conforming which is typically not the case. Sometimes they're the same, but but we're good to go. Notice the credit score requirements. If you have a client that has lower credit scores than that, their rates most likely will be a little bit higher or their fees, one or the other. That's pretty much it. Uh, this week, I don't think we've done this in a while or haven't done. I want to talk about pre, the pre-qualification form. And as, a, as an agent, what you want to look for from your lender to make sure is actually giving you the information that you really want to make sure that in this market, many of you are receiving multiple offers, right? You're going to have multiple pre-quals. Here's how you distinguish between all of them that you might get. This first one is what we call a credit-only PQF. And as you'll notice, what we've what we've checked yes to is uh, simply that we've had a conversation with the client and we've pulled a credit report. So line 17 through 19. Yeah. Yes yeah. and yes. Yeah. And then everything else is a no or not applicable. And sometimes we try to hide and put a little extra not, not applicable in there to make it look better than it can. I mean, we can play those tricks as a lender, I suppose. But but you'll notice this is we haven't looked at pay stubs. We haven't looked at W-2s. We haven't verified the down payment. So we've just looked at credit. And, and so the moral to the story is uh, as a listing agent, when you're getting an offer, you have to look at this carefully. Exactly. Uh, don't assume just because you received one that, <laughs> that exactly. all, the, all the correct boxes are checked. Right. And, and if the uh, loan officer hasn't already reached out to you as a listing agent to present this buyer, which I highly recommend, that's what we do all the time, um, then make sure you call the, the lender and discuss it. With them. So the objective is to have all the yeses checked. Well, yeah, the ones yeah. that are applicable. Well, hey, let's look to the next one. Right. OK, look. Uh, here's here's what I call the full P PQF, the best one. Nice. You'll, you'll notice that we have all the yeses checked. Right. We, we have looked at pay stubs. We have looked at W-2s. We have looked at tax returns. Um, and then over to the far right was also checked as other DU approval. That's important too. Do, did we run it through the computer model to, to make sure? And we do that, but then we go a step further in, we actually have an underwriter that does it all, right? So we know that the information is accurate because if you're not inputting the pr information properly into the DU system, you know, you know, the old garbage in, garbage out. And so this is really what you want to see. You say you're, there's no contingencies up top. You look at line seven, eight, nine. Clients married, not relying on the sale or the lease. Even if you're moving out, you're going to keep your house. And if it's contingent upon you getting rental income, that is checked because it's contingent upon a lease. It may not be contingent upon a sale. Um, then you're not relying on seller concessions. And this is not a down payment assistance line 12. And so that's really what you want to see. Here's the third one. You notice it's handwritten. Our system doesn't even issue these. Um, but it, but you, we can actually issue one on check line three that says buyer has not even talked to a lender. So you can issue, get you can look at a prequal. You can have an agent that issues one of these, and they and their client has never even can fill out an application. But here's the form, right? It's like the old letters we used to get 15 years ago. There you go, the old letters that you used to get. So buyer has not consulted. Um, and the other thing that I checked in here, which you kind of want to look for, is buyer is either married, unmarried, 
or legally separated. I checked legally separated here and in a community property state, legally separated, still legally married. Right. And so that's really the case. So what there's extra steps in there that that potential ex spouse needs to do. We encourage all of our clients to try to finalize that divorce if possible. Otherwise, your soon to be ex spouse has to sign deeds, acknowledge you're getting a loan. Uh, they, and a lot of them will say, yes, I had a deal. It's been about a year or so. It's a new build. But when it finally got down to it, the, the soon to be ex wife said, no, I'm not signing. And then the buyer lost their deposit, lost everything. And and walk away so yeah and then if uh, if they're having problems uh getting their uh their spouse to cooperate or they're soon to be ex-spouse just go to hitman.com <laughs> and uh that'll take care of that problem i'll let you go on record <laughs> i let you go on record saying i don't condone that service <laughs> all right yeah. uh, talk to us about the books at baker team difference well we mentioned it earlier you know we we have fully pre underwritten loan packages and so that's why they close you know in the six and a half years i've said this before i've been on our team for six and a half years all of my deals close, right? They all close and they close on time. And so my team makes me look good all the time. And uh, I very, very you appreciate it. Right? Yeah, we like to make the agent look good as well so we can get future business. No question. All right. Thanks. Appreciate Thank it, Mick. Nice. And Thank as you. always, um, I'm making fat look good. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we used to always say really we had faces that. for radio, but <laughs> yeah. that might not be the case anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, Mick, as always, appreciate it. Uh, they're in our offices. If you got any questions, um, need a need a pre-qualification form filled out for a client, whatever the case is, they are always available for you. All right, uh, moving right along. Um, I don't know what happened to our announcements, um, <laughs> but uh, that's odd. Wow. All right, so, all right, so we're gonna, <laughs> okay, well, there you go. All right, so uh, we're gonna jump right into our three-pack, Todd. Um, traits of highly successful agents, part two. Uh, part we've been, two. Uh, this has been a series that we've been going over. And uh, so what we've got right now is uh, starting with the, the very first one is uh, a successful agent, um, a, a top producing agent is an agent that persists through business challenges. Um, you know, and, and obviously we have life challenges and personal challenges and things like that. But uh, as a real estate agent, we have business challenges. Uh, not everything uh, goes to plan. True. And no matter how good you are as an agent, no matter how good you are at closing, uh, how good you are in sales. I don't know of any agent, any top producing agent out there that hasn't lost a deal or a multiple deals or have had bad things happen in their business. Bad things do happen. That's just, uh, that's just the way that it goes. That's just yeah. reality. Bad things will happen to you. And so for a lot of agents, um, it, it causes paralysis. And they're paralyzed in their business because such and such bad thing happened. Uh, and so it's not the events that we face that shape us, but it's how we respond to the events. When negative things happen to us, uh, that's not a reflection on us. It's not a reflection on our skills. Um, it's how we respond and how we persist through these successful agents. Uh, Todd, just simply, uh, they just keep going. Well, I think that that's it. It's not so much whether something that, that things don't happen to those people. What it really is, is that they don't allow that those is those instances to affect their performance. Um, uh, there's a poem written by a, an author called a writer called Charles Swindoll, and it's called Attitude. And on the second to last sentence, it says life is 10 percent what happens to you yeah. and 90 percent how you react to it. There's that delicate gap between information coming into our head and the words and things that come out of our mouths. And so from a perspective of top performers, you know, they're they're calculative. I mean, even when bad things happen, they stop for a minute and they allow it to absorb so that they can choose the best response method. And that could be just dust yourself up, be, pick yourself up, dust yourself off and start all over again like we tell our kids. Yeah. And sometimes too, also for them, when those bad things happen, uh, sometimes bad things happen uh, as a result of, of mistakes that we make. True. Um, and so they take the time to assess, okay, can't fix the problem necessarily. I might have lost the deal, lost the buyer, lost the seller. Um, but what can I glean from this? What can I, what, what can I do? What kind of changes can I make to ensure that it doesn't happen again. You know, that 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 right there is, I think, uh, the, par the, the key piece of what we're talking about is, you know, how do we continuously improve our performance so that we don't have those same repetitious events? All right, uh, the second trait of highly successful agents is they are self-aware. 
And this is uh, this is one of my favorite ones uh, because as agents, uh, we each come to the table with with different skills. Mm -hmm. We have different skill sets. Um, we have different backgrounds. We got different levels of education. Um, and so it's not so much of where you you're sitting at the table, and it's not so much of your skill set and what your you know and your your skills. It's are you aware of what those are? Mm -hmm. Are you aware of what you're good at and what you're not good at? And in top producing agents, they acknowledge what they're good at and they they realize what they're not good at. They don't stick their head in the sand and and just ignore everything around them and ignore what they can do and what they can't do. Uh, and they never pretend to be great at something. Don't ever pretend to be great at something that you're not. If, if you're not good at a certain, you know, marketing, if you're not good at marketing, then hire someone to do it do for it. you or right. become a student of it rather than just simply pretending. Also top producers, they simply figure out how to compensate for any deficiencies that they have. And I, and as I've gotten older and I've, I've, you know, I look back on my career and I constantly am assessing the different things that I'm doing. And I've gotten to a point in life where I, I am a little more self-aware. I can acknowledge, hey, I'm not really good at this or or I'm, I'm doing this and I'm not getting the response that I want. I just don't pretend right. and I don't put the blame on other people. Well, it, 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 it's me. And, and how can I figure out and how can I improve it? And when you are self-aware and you're, you're self-examining your business model and your skill set, this is what helps us become better and stronger and it improves our strengths. You know, any true leader, true person who's, who's got great accomplishments in numerous books that I've, re I've read have all said the same thing. You know, it's, it's like the difference between professionals is knowing what you know, knowing what you don't know and knowing the difference between the two. And then, and, and then, then knowing the people who can help you. And then, well, <laughs> but see, that's the thing. Years ago, they used to say uh, to take your weaknesses and improve upon them and spend time improving upon them. But the reality is in the last two decades, they've said, no, don't do that. Exploit your strengths and forget and get other people to assist you with those weaknesses in which you have. And it's okay. You know, you said something earlier also, you said you're now at the point of being able to say, hey, you know, I, I don't know that. That's a great question. And I think when we're new in real estate, our problem is that we think we're supposed to have all the answers and that if we don't have the answers, our consumers are not going to want to do business with us. Yeah. And it's always, we always joke when it comes down to marketing pieces, we put stuff in the mail. And, and I think it's a great analogy of being self-aware. If, you, if you've been sending the same postcard for 12 months and haven't had any response, that is it's not the neighbors. <laughs> it's the, they've responded and it says your marketing sucks, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's being self-aware. Right. And, 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 right. and we just have to, to, we have to assess ourselves. And then the third uh, trait of highly successful agents is they are focused on their goals. I don't know how many, we just say that, focus on your goals, focus yeah. on your goals, but how many people really know what it means and take it to heart? Most people we can acknowledge never write down their goals, mm -hmm. but some of us do write down our goals. And for me, it's not enough to just write down my goals. We must review them on a regular basis. We need to assess we, where we're at with achieving our goals. Uh, top producers just don't let business happen to them. No. Um, if you just if you're just waiting for business to fall from the sky, it's it's not going to happen. They go out and they make it happen. They set their goals and they're focused on their goals. Uh, and always know where you're at when it comes to achieving your goals. Know where you're, know where you're at with the timeline. Anytime. Assess your goals. If this is your goal to do X Y Z before 2019 starts, where are you at with it? And assess it and modify it. Right. You know. Uh Let's face it. We've heard if you don't have a plan, you plan to fail, right? Plan, fail to plan, plan to fail. Uh, but the reality really boils down to the fact that that it's not so much writing down your goals. Goals are wishes if they're not acted upon. So the reality is, do you have an action plan? And they started that actually a long time ago in corporate America, which was, OK, this may be your goal, but what are you going to do to get there? and then set those milestones and then and then tell somebody tell a colleague about it or tell your somebody that you trust that isn't going to you know uh, that that's going to support and help you uh, achieve those goals but then again also provide you with the accountability that isn't going to let you slack yeah and i and i know there's some agents uh, listening to this watching this right now going blah 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 hear this stuff mm -hmm. all the time but this is the difference between the average agent and, and how and top producers are approaching their business and even a lot of top producers they don't even really have to think about these things it's just no. become an aid it's, it's what they do but when you take a look at top producers and if you're watching this and listening to this and you want to become a top producer pay attention this is this is right. what top producers do so this is our cool. three pack yep. if you like copies of the slides you can uh, request them at webinar at westusa.com.
All right, so uh, moving right along, a couple announcements. Um, so we got a little Sevrar. This is for those people who are on the East Valley or members of uh, the Sevrar board. Um, but we have the board elections coming up, and uh, our very own Michael Hofstetter is running for uh, director. Um, so we want to encourage all of our West USA agents or anyone listening to this. Um, they probably should have gotten emails by now, right? Yeah, well, they should. Uh, Sevrar sent them out a couple of times, and you'll have you receive them a few more times. We have Chuck Balson also, who is uh, in the Mesa Stapley office, who works with uh, Bob Mary Millard mm -hmm. out there. Okay, uh, he's running for a director nominee position. And then the DR director is your broker representatives. And that's Mike's also running. Um, and you're going to get to pick two in each category. So, you know, this gives you the opportunity to, you know, pick a West USA agent and potentially also pick someone else if you think it would be great for the membership leadership. Any uh, any write in abilities? Or they just and write there my is. Name? All right. Yeah. Hey, I'm running now. Yeah. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but yeah, so. So uh, take the time. This is something that is that is very, very important. It is. Uh, and I know, um, and I always say this about regular elections, you know, in, in our nation. If you don't vote, don't complain. Yeah. Yeah. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well. <laughs> hashtag shut up <laughs> thank you for that Todd all right so, so <laughs> how to, tell us how you really feel yeah, about well, people who don't yeah. vote hey, that is your voice right you had the chance all right Keith Flynn and I uh we are doing this, this is what we're excited about this is actually kind of a, a, a non-West USA event um but of course our West USA agents are invited and if you got friends in other brokerages uh we encourage you to attend for if for nothing else it's at Urban Margarita and I hear the margaritas are are <laughs> okay those are sound effects by sarah yes so she <laughs> likes them but anyway so this is coming up uh next tuesday at, at th from 3 to 5 p.m at urban margarita mm -hmm. it's in the glendale area uh so uh you we're gonna send you the email you're gonna email an rsvp with jill st croix um, and um, so there's the email address right there. So what we're doing is we're just going to go over the ins and the outs of, and, and we did a couple of these on the west side or the east side. And everybody on the west side is like, well, when are you coming out here? So we're coming out to the west side to do this, but taking you through what is mark the difference between marketing, advertising, and having a brand. And I will take you step by step and explain why you need a brand, what a brand does for you, and how you take a look at your business and assess your business and begin to build a brand for your business because then in the end that's really what will drive uh, more business to you. And then uh, then uh, then Keith will follow up with that really talking about um uh you know social media and finding your voice on video now that you've thought about your brand and then I don't think we have slides for this, but tomorrow and th tomorrow we're going to Keith and I are going up to the White Mountains. So That'll for everybody awesome. who's working with the Olivas up there, um, email them, find out our schedule. But we're coming up there and we're going to do the same materials. And then we're going to finish up on Thursday afternoon in the our Fountain Hills office. So be on the lookout for <laughs> that. And uh, I'm really excited. Um, more, more importantly, I love the Olivas. I love what they're doing up there. But uh, we're going to have a burger at the Red Onions. Oh, and I'm go. really excited about yep. that. All right. Um, also, we are rolling out uh, we're going to send you this link right now we're going to keep adding events uh we are excited uh todd to be in our new uh, home we office are. up here on i-17 101 corridor uh literally um okay we don't have a mcdonald's in the parking lot but we are in walking distance from an in and in out, out. And uh, so I did that the other day, and then yesterday I did the Costco hot dog. Fantastic! Uh, so we're right down, right across the street from a. Um, we're across the street from everything. Oh, cheese steaks. Oh, geez. Oh, yeah. So come on up, take me to lunch, and uh, we'll chat. Uh, but anyway, so so you want to go to westusaevents.com because all fall we want to bring all of our agents to come on up here. Yeah. Check out the office, and we're uh, rolling out all kinds of incredible uh, classes. One of them coming up on September 21st. Uh, Aaron Lacey, who's a really good friend of mine, really becoming, uh, really developing. He's on the becoming on the national scene. He's becoming an influencer. Yeah, and he's a market disruptor. Yeah. And when it comes down to uh, marketing, branding, and really on this, and I and I love. It's all about story, telling your story, finding your story. So you want to get signed up for this. Uh, so this is going to be Friday, September 21st in the afternoon. Uh, so get signed up for that. Again, we sent you the link, and there's a multiple events um, that you'll find on this link. We are also, on, and I know this is far away, but you do want to get signed up for this. Uh, we're having our pro secrets. Um, man, we always talk about... Amazing. 
what what top producers do, how they think. But this is your chance to, to sit and listen to three of our top producers share uh, their their different unique businesses and approaches to building successful real estate businesses. Uh, and then there's going to be a Q&A. Yeah. That, that to me, that I think is where you're going to get most of the people because now you get a chance to ask the question that maybe you did not get the answer to. And we always tell you in your office, you know, take a top producer out to lunch, but they're busy. Yeah. It's hard to it's hard to nail them down. So totally. now you get a chance to hang out with uh, three of them. Cool. So that's going to be uh, October 19th. All these events are at our new corporate facility. So. All right. So that's it. All right. We are going to we're talking now about FERPTA. Todd, what do you know about FERPTA? <laughs> you know Aren't you supposed to say excuse me after yeah, you say exactly. that? No. Um, FERPTA. <coughs> excuse me. I mean, but uh, this is this is I, I think we, is, we find more agents getting into trouble uh, because they're not yeah. aware of FERPTA, how it works, what it is. So we've asked our very good friends at American Title to I said, you know, I said to Ron Quain, I said, uh, we need somebody. We need to talk about FERPTA. It's a big problem. It's a big question that we're getting. Issue. And so uh, he sent us Bill Cope. And so, Bill, thank you. Welcome. And we appreciate you being here. And so, um, so yeah, we're going to let you kind of take over and talk to us about FERPTA, what it is and what we need to know. OK, wonderful. Thank you for the invitation. Our, our goal today is to try and simplify FERPTA as best as we can. The one thing, if you look in the title of the act itself, it's really a misnomer. It says Real Property Tax Act. For all practical reasons, it's not a tax, it's withholding requirement. It doesn't become taxable until they actually file a tax return. And that point is just income like you and I might And these pay. are non-USA citizens. Non-USA, right. Anyone who is not a resident or is a citizen or is a not a non-resident is subject to FERPTA. Okay, let's go over some of the main high points or what I see are the high points. First of all, hey, any- Bill, can I just kind of preempt yes. this? I'm really sorry for interrupting at this yes. point, but um, just so that, you know, those of you that are listening in don't, you know, decide this is a good time to step away from the, you know, your, your speakers, um, you know, this, and, and correct me, Bill, if I'm wrong, but, you know, years ago, uh, the, the Canadians kind of helped us in, in the marketplace control about 37% of the sales that took place during those tough times. Wow. And so, so, you know, what ended up happening is when when these people now the, the need for the knowledge here is when people are now selling these properties, um, you know, they have a if they're a non-resident legal, whatever the terminology is, I'm sorry. Uh, but the point that I'm trying to make is, is they owe an excise tax to the federal government on the sale of their property. Um, and so they have two choices. They can do some tax preparing ahead of time where they estimate what their tax is going to be and or they can wait for the sale. And I'm hearing from some of our Canadian friends that it takes up to 18 months to get the difference back uh, if you've overpaid, which is most of the time. It's probably not out of the realm of yeah. So so what we're trying to talk about today is a way that agents need to know this so they don't put their seller, their client in a situation where they're not going to be able to, to get the full amount of their proceeds at the close of, of the transaction. Because if they file ahead of time, there's no way know, to file pre prematurely, you know, not with timelines as they are right now. Too and, we, and we'll go over that okay. within the presentation because timelines are very, very critical. So keep your ears on everybody. This is the purpose. Uh, as I said, the FERP rate for any non-citizen or if they are a non-resident alien are is automatically 15 percent. The Seller is the person who's actually responsible for providing the funds for the FERPTA withholding. However, and this is the sticker, it is the buyer who is actually responsible for remitting it to IRS and is the buyer who has actually assessed any kind of penalties or interest if there is a promise with the filing. The logic behind of it is pretty simple. If the if the once the sellers, if their sellers are foreign, once the transaction is complete, they're gone. Uncle Sam wants a door to knock on. Yeah, and, and, and then they wonder why we don't like the IRS and we don't like our <laughs> elected officials. Well, and this is why, yeah, and this is one of the odd situations where really the, someone other than the taxpayer is, is responsible for the tax, which sucks. But, the, and this is really points to the process where it is so key for us to know what we're doing so that we can protect the buyer the seller, the client, or the agents, as well as the title company itself. 
even though the rate itself is 15%, there are some opportunities where the withholding can either be reduced, exempted. And the first two ones that we deal with most commonly are what I refer to as a buyer's use exemption or a rate reduction. Essentially, if the buyer is going to use it as a personal residence, at that point, then we actually can get the rate reduced to even to zero or reduced to 10 percent, depending on the transaction amount. The last opportunity or another opportunity that the seller has where they would be able to apply for a withholding certificate. And this is what they were alluding to. At the time the sale is consummated, they can apply for a withholding certificate. And what the holding certificate does, it essentially bases the tax withholding amount based on the anticipated tax price, not based on the entire transaction itself. Mm -hmm. The premise in the FERPTA is if you spot it for $300,000, they are going to tax you on $300,000 until you show how much your basis in that property actually is. The next point is timing is very, very critical when it comes to FERPTA, especially on the withholding certificate. If, they're, if the seller is going to apply for the withholding certificate, it must be completed and submitted to IRS on or before the day of close. If it is not done in that time frame, we would be required to remit the standard withholding. There, there is still an opportunity for the seller. Once the withholding certificate is, up or is issued by IRS, they can use that to help to apply for an early refund. Early refund, as you said, that's probably a misnomer. Yeah, I've, I've heard the same situation months. If I have ran into a couple of situations where here's one, we put the wrong year on the sale. Every other date was proper. They came back and immediately uh, assessed a, a fine of probably $15,000. And it was just because of the typo. It was yeah. taking us months to get that resolved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lastly, as we said before, the way that it is taxable income, just like us U.S. citizens, they do have to apply for a or complete a tax return. If they don't complete a tax return and we have remitted, they will never see the money. Yeah. Okay. In order to help yourselves, your client, and your escrow officer, there are four questions that we really need, would like to know. It will help us lead you in the, in the transaction, how, what documentation is required, what kind of withholding is required, et cetera, et cetera. And each one of these we'll cover uh, briefly in the next few minutes. The first question is, is the seller a U.S. citizen or resident alien? The second question is, do they both have a taxpayer identification number? All U.S. citizens are going to, they're going to have social security numbers. Anyone who is foreign may or may not have a tax identification number. The third question, and really the, sometimes the more problematic one, is what is the buyer going to use the property for? If it's going to be a personal residence, there are some, as I said before, there are some opportunities to have reduced withholdings for the seller. And lastly, does the seller intend on applying for withholding certificate in order to attempt to either reduce or become exempt for the withholding itself? Okay, let's take the first question. Is the seller a U.S. citizen or a resident alien? If they are, we're done. It's the subject, it is not subject to FERPTA. We would just have them sign a certificate of non-foreign status, which every title company should be having every seller sign regardless. So is that. this an agent's responsibility or the no, title company's title responsibility? Company. Right. This okay. would be the, okay. any documentation, most of the documentation, depending on your title company, that's going to really depend on who's going to do what. I've, over my career, I've tried to become as far as involved in FERP as possible so I can really help our clients out. And we you know, we use it as a source of business. A lot of title companies won't even, or they won't want to handle it as a third party outside of escrow. Pure risk. I, as a buyer, would never do it. It just puts everything on your shoulders. Okay, so as I said, if they have a tax identification number, we're done. If not, we strongly, or if they were not, FERPTA would apply. The most common question that we run into is, how do we know that the seller is for it? You know, you're not going to know looking at them. You're probably not going to know talking to them. All I can tell you is listen to the client comments. If you hear them drop a, 
a comment like, I can't wait to get back to Toronto, chances are you may want to ask the question. <laughs> if it's a situation, it's a part-time resident. Yeah, well, there's an opportunity to find out where their primary resident is. Same thing. If it's in Puerto, well, Puerto Rico, is U.S., mm -hmm. but if it's in Costa Rica, you probably have it for the issue. Um, with the unvented DocuSave, it creates a couple issues. Um, there is a disclosure requirement in your contract that does say the seller has to inform our parties that they are a foreign citizen. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, with DocuSign, I go right to the initialing and the pay I never read the thing. And probably 99% of your clients do not read that mm -hmm. massive document. So it is, it is up to us to keep our ears open to see if we can get a clue. Last thing you really want is to get down to closing, find out that they are a foreign seller. We didn't know anything about it. And the whole thing blows up in everyone's face. The next question is, is do they have a taxpayer identification number? Same thing, if, if they do, no, you don't have to do anything or your clients won't have to do anything. If they do not have a tax uh, payer identification number, they call it I-10 for abbreviation. I recommend that they apply it simultaneously with our FERP to remittance or with the application for withholding certificate. You cannot apply for a tax payer identification number without having a contract at the time. Mm -hmm. That's where the timing becomes screwed, mm. is that we're looking for 30-day closes. IRS acts on hopefully within 90 days. So it is a possible to circumvent actually submission, but it's not going to get past the withholding at least at the time of the closing. That's what you're yep, relating exactly. to. Yep. A few years ago, they were a little more lax, but now if you don't have a contract, you don't get well, it. Well, and there's more foreign sellers today than there was. And that was what I was trying to allude to earlier is that we're running into this situation and imagine that your seller is buying another house and needs the proceeds of sale to buy the new house because that's what they think they're getting only to find out that there's going to be a withholding yeah. because they did or didn't do something or the buyer isn't going to occupy it for, isn't it 50% of the time over the next two years or something like that? It's, it, you know, yeah. yeah. So whatever those conditions, those exemptions may be that don't apply, um, you know, could really cause another transaction to have a problem. Yes. The last thing you want is to surprise it close. Right. So, yeah, yeah, as I said, you really want to, you don't want any surprises that close. The more you the more we know what's happening, the better we can direct you and your clients. Uh, let's see. One thing your clients should know is if they are needing to apply for an ITIN, if they're doing it themselves, they do need to have a certified copy of their uh, of the their passport that cannot be certified by a notary. It has to be certified by the consulate. If they're going to be using a CPA to complete a withholding certificate, oftentimes a CPA can assist in that regard and a streamline the process for them as well. If a TIN is not possessed and we end up remitting money, the IRS does not basically acknowledge that or actually attribute that to anyone's account. It's like going to a bank and saying, here, put this in Fred's account without a number. It's not going to happen. Uh, they do, if they do receive our funds without the proper identification number, they will send a letter to the taxpayer requesting the completion of the uh, form. And at that point, they will uh, receive a validated document. Next question, and this is what you were alluding to, is what, what is the buyer going to use the residence for? If they are going to use it as a personal residence at that situation, then it may be as may be able to offer some reduced withholding rates. Primary residence is not required. It is IRS has unique definition for personal reference or for a personal re residence. I'm going to all but read the paragraph. The conditions are they have to uh, live in or be using the property at least 50% of the time that their property is being used by anybody. And the test is for the first two 12 month periods of the time of their ownership. I've provided two different examples here. If you look to the right, I will, you'll note that I put in that the property has been vacant for six months, is going to be vacant for six months. And that says, and with that, 
that time frame is not at all factored into what the occupancy period is. In the first situation, we have the owner going to be using the property for four to six occupied months, and someone else is going to be in there the other two months. It may be a rental, it may be uh, friends, family don't count, family or the family are the same as the owner. So maybe rental, maybe a friend, whatever the case might be. In this case, if they're going to occupy it for this occupied six months, that's going to be 67%. It exceeds the threshold of 50%. So wow. it would qualify as a personal residence. So it's, no, it's not six months necessarily. No. It's, it's 50% of the unoccupied time. Perfect. Wow. So if it's a situation where they only come down here for one week a year, yep. and they are not going to use it for anything else, it's a personal residence. Wow. If they are going to be down here for seven days and someone else is going to be using it for 14 days, it disqualifies. That is, it. That is a very misunderstood clause. Oh, trust me. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. very much so. Totally. And this is one of the, once you get a grasp it in, I think visually, once you see it visually, it makes it a lot easier. It, it took me a little totally. bit of time to come up with this kind of a concept. On the second example, the same thing. First, the six months that's vacant doesn't count. So we're looking at, in this case, the owner is going to use it for two of the six occupied months. It's only 33%. It doesn't qualify. So as a result, there is no uh, buyer's use uh, exemption or reduction available to the seller. Hmm. This is where the buyer's use actually benefits the seller tremendously. Okay, now that we determined whether or not the property qualifies as a personal residence, now we need to figure out what is the withholding rate that IRS is going to expect us to deal with. Okay, in the first situation, if the property is being sold for $300,000 or less, the buyer is using it as a personal residence, and they're willing to certify to that fact, the withholding, that it's exempt from the withholding, it would be zero. One thing you do need to keep in mind is that the buyer's use cert certification is completely voluntary on the buyer's mm -hmm. part. They can refuse, they can refuse for no reason. I've only had a couple people do it, and it's because they didn't really understand it was definite intent in their, their requirement and to me, it's not a big deal. Intent is based on what are you going to do today? Yeah. I could, I intend to live in my house for the next 20 years. I can get hit by, by bus when I leave here. Mm -hmm. And the same situation applies. Look at it in the same way you would look at an owner occupied when it comes to loans. It's all based on intent at the time of the transaction. The second situation is if the transaction is above 300K and up to a million dollars, the buyer is going to use it as a personal residence and the buyer or is willing to certify to that fact, then their withholding rate is reduced to 10%. And lastly, if it, the property is for more than a million, the buyer is not going to use it as a personal residence or they're flat not willing to uh, sign the certification. At that point, it would be the standard withholding rate of 15%. So that certification, um, is that a armless form or is that a, I mean, a, uh, AAR form? No. Is this a form that they get from the title company? From the title company. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. From the title company. So again, this is still the title company only handling this in the background. The virtually nothing, no documentation is really required by, from the uh, realtor. Right. Okay. It's really going to be, once we're notified that this is the situation of, is what it is. At that point, our escrow officer will be able to help direct what documentation is required. Anytime one of my staff called me or any of my escrow people would call, first two questions out of my mouth was, how much and what are the buyers going to do? That sets up the entire conversation as far as what the rate's going to be and are they going to live it in or not. So this knowledge that you're helping us with today is something that an agent would use to set clear expectations with their seller and also to ensure that the seller doesn't have a domino effect because they've been improperly yes. you know, communicated with them. It's not our responsibility. However, as licensed realtors, you know, experiential realtors, the reason you hire one over the other is because they have more experience. This is the experience factor that you're you're saying to us today. Absolutely. Be aware of this. Here's some of these awareness is things. absolutely the key. Yeah. I have no expectations of client or clients or realtors really learning the process. 
it is, it's really a very simple process, but there's a lot of questions, a lot of ins and outs to it that you really need to be aware of. So worst case scenario, a realtor, instead of having them just DocuSign without anything, DocuSign, make people aware of the FERPTA requirement or that, at least that clause, which, which did you read that clause? Yes or no, you know, cause it affects people who aren't, you know, residents of the United States. And, you know, and then of course, if people say, well, yeah, that, that applies to me, then the next question is, well, here, why don't you contact my title representative at American title? Absolutely. Okay. And that is, and there's really no read for to act as a go between. No. Point him in our direction, and we'll get it taken care of. We'll know, we'll know the questions, and if our escrow staff doesn't know the questions, they'll be leading it to someone else in our accounting staff. Okay. As I said, at the if none of the exemptions or reductions apply, then they would be uh, they would still have the opportunity to apply for a withholding certificate if they so choose. This is what we mentioned before: is this is what takes it from taxing for the full transaction amount to determine just exactly what the gain was and going on that basis. There are some key points to this that we do need to be aware of, and that is this. It would, and this is our company's approach to this. It is not everyone's approach. Some do not want to do anything with it at all. As long as the client abides by what our requirements are, we're very willing to withhold the funds until IRS makes a determination on withholding certificate. We will not complete certificate for clients. That is a tax issue that even as a CPA, I'm not a tax person. I'm not going to hang that on myself. So I, we would strongly encourage that someone who is interested in doing it, that they talk to a, a qualified CPA. Here's some of the key points so that the seller is responsible. As I said, the seller is responsible for completing it, submitting it to IRS. They must submit it on or before the day to close or it can just simply be used as a means to apply for an early refund. We require a full copy of the package as well as evidence of mailing. We need to know when that document was sent. Uh, a verbal statement would not hold any water in our books at all. The other requirement, and this is really key, is on the withholding certificate application, we require that our company be listed as the return address. In some circumstances, we will allow the client's CPA to be uh, have everything returned to them. We're very picky. The only, even if we authorize an outside CPA to, to do it on the client's behalf, we will require that they provide us written assurances that they will give us notification immediately of any, of, of I just lost my assurances. Yeah. Well, I just saw the, how much time I have yeah. left, so my mind went away. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, on, the C, on the CPA, we would want to have them give us written assurances that they would give us communication any quickly and uh, promptly of any IRS communication. The time frame in that is critical because if they reject it, what's going to, or if they require more information, they're going to send it back to the address. They're going to give them 30 days to provide the additional information. And at that point, if it's not received, the application is going to be rejected blatantly. Once IRS does make its de final determination, they will send back their, the, the determination to that same address. If it's a situation where we are required to remit any withholding to them whatsoever, it has to be done within 20 days of the day of their letter. If it's not done, penalties apply, and the penalties start at about 20 or 25 percent. So it's not cheap, Ooh. and especially if you're talking a million dollar property, and you're now you're talking 150 thousand dollars in withholding. I don't want to pay that penalty out of my paycheck. Thank you. Um, let's see. Typically, IRS will respond within 90 days. I say typically, I've seen it less. It depends on the situation. If they are applying for an ITIN simultaneously, you can add an easy 30 to 60 days to that. If they are going back and needing additional information, you can look at another 30 or 60 days. 90 days is typical, but not guaranteed by any stretch of the imagination. So when you said filing was from uh, from contract, did you mean purchase contract or listing contract? In other words, they only had so many days to file within, but they ha they couldn't begin it until there was okay. a contract. If you have a signed purchase contract, purchase contract. it doesn't okay. have to be closed. Okay. It has to okay. be uh, yeah. effective at that point. Now, here's the kick. I have had people go into local IRS, and depending on which county you're standing on, they're going to give you a different story. 
I've had some that no problem. Here's a contract. Everything is taken care of immediately. I've had some people go to counter and say, oh, no, we can't do that until it closes. So it's beware. That's that's it is not a clean Come cut back at situation. lunchtime when there's a shift yeah. change. <laughs> we, yeah. We should always be concerned when you call the IRS and their words on the recording is, you cannot rely on our information. Well, heavens, isn't that special? <laughs> okay, that pretty much wraps up for to be aware. Don't try to be a tax expert on it because very few of us are, including myself. Be aware, that's the main thing. If you hear the magic words and you find out that you're seller or if you find out that you're the opposing seller, if you're the buyer's agent and you find out that the seller is possibly foreign, get your ears perked up because it's going to kind of come back and haunt you. And that's it. Thank you for your well, time. Good. Hopefully you're still awake. No, uh, yeah, it's really interesting. I, I tell you, Todd, I, I should run for office. And I, I can just, I can just sim simplify so much of this. Just how about the buyer's not involved? It's the government's responsibility to collect with the sellers of foreign, uh, foreign national. Simple but the as buyer that. is involved, but, but uh, they shouldn't be. Well, the, I own, if I'm if I'm Canadian, I yeah. own the property. I'm yeah. selling. I should be paying taxes. Well, it's like it's like the city of Avondale. When I it, it just drove me nuts. <laughs> okay, as a as a property owner and as a landlord. Okay, the city of Avondale would let my tenants go six months without paying the water bill. Okay. Then the tenant would take off in, in the middle of the night. My new tenant would go in, go down and put the water on. And the city of Avondale said, nope, landlord's got to pay for it. And I'm like, it's your, it's not my fault you didn't collect. That's right. I, no, I hear you. I do. <laughs> well, you know, and these are the kinds of things that, you know, can people sometimes talk to one title representative right. or I'm escrow representative. Support. People want yeah. to, people to run. And, and, and these people, well, we all want free hamburgers instead of taxes. <laughs> but the thing is, is, is that we... This uh, is National yeah. Cheeseburger Decade. There you go. <laughs> uh, but again, I, I think the important thing here is that the average person that this is a domino the potentially a domino effect but so it be. well no That's i get my that. point I, no, I get that. i can simplify everything but again i think there's if if people would take the time to just listen to this a few times you know and, well, and you get an understanding of it you know i think the biggest uh you know thing today was that you bill you you explained to everybody that 50 percent isn't 50 percent of 12 months calendar wise it's 50 percent of that occupancy time so i mean i think that there are some lessons right in here that can clarify some things but i also think that the that the practice that we're asking them to follow is basically you know bring it up i mean if you bring up the FERPTA clause you will discover at least some communication that will take place and and hopefully you know i, I want to also clarify this the people that come to america to invest it's because america is the land of opportunity america is the only place where you can come and and basically buy and own home own yeah, land own point. a piece of the you know piece of dirt piece of the earth and you know and so the fact is is that this is a great place there's a lot of countries a lot of people from a lot of countries that invest here in america and this is a key factor but these aren't ignorant people <laughs> these people know they're going to pay a tax and what they're looking for is to pay as little as they possibly can like any investor so they probably have already prepared for a lot of this but the situation here is what happens if they have it. Yeah. So, Bill, uh, so do um, do are all title companies going through the same process uh, to to determine whether a seller is a is 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 not a U.S. citizen? No. Okay. I would I would venture to say not. Uh, at close. Or at some point, I was about to say, at close, some, it's, it's, it's a little late, late. Yeah. right? But at some point in the transaction, when that should be, I don't know. Is that they're sh they're going to have them sign a certification non foreign status or mm -hmm. non foreign status or Patriot Act, right? Mm -hmm. right? So at that point, that is the only time that we as a title company are all equal or get a first time of a certification from the client saying who they are. At that point, if they certify that they are U.S. citizens. We're done. The question on, and there are there are several certifications that we would require as documentation, basically to so that we can protect ourselves and protect the buyer or seller. The um, certifications are valid, and it's amazing to what degree, unless you become aware that that certification is invalid. 
If you do not act on that information, you just signed on to fraud. All right. So I, I, so I guess my recommendation would be for all of our agents. Um, I know um, there's a gazillion title companies out there, but this is maybe a question to have um, with your title rep. Yeah, make, and ensure, you know, what is your title company? What's the process? And what do they do? And, yes. and how how experienced are are your um, title? Not the title reps, but the escrow officers. It's really key to find out what your processes are in our in my company. And I've moved on to a different role, and but and my replacement is doing the same thing. Our staff prepares the documentation, submits it for review, and then we're going ahead yep. and uh, advise them what we need to sell do. And, and the, ta- some oh. title, let me interrupt one. One thing, it, your your statement is finding out what the title company are going to do is very critical up front. I have seen a couple of the uh, t- other title agency agreements, which basically sends the clients on their way as out of escrow. And I indicated to someone earlier, I would, as a set buyer, I would never do it out of escrow. That just puts all the risk on them. Know what you're, and they're trying to waive the liability. Yeah. Uh, make sure that the people or the, your title company is well versed on it, and make sure that if they're going to use a CPA, that they're well versed on it. All right, and then uh, lastly, uh, you know, Todd, you'd mentioned because I was thinking about this. You know, maybe add it to your listing presentation when you're sitting and, and talking with sellers. But I would, I would hesitate or not hesitate. I would warn you if you're going to do it. Um, you do it for everyone, not oh, just absolutely. because, just because not, you know, you can't walk in and say, okay, this person point. has an accent, yeah. uh, looks like they're from a different part of the country. <laughs> Cause yeah, you just better set yourself up for, so, uh, for so, me, yeah. I'm putting the onus on the title company. Well, but, the, but there is, every, you there's not a single one that I've been yeah. able to recognize every, everyone. Yeah. I, they, as far as I know, they were in Scottsdale. Yeah. You know? yeah you're just not yeah. going to know yeah. that way. I, you know, it's just as simple as if you add it to a presentation, like, like the one, Mike, that we used to do before the pre-listing presentation presentation you drop off the night before and then you know and you really never go through it but what you've done is you've at least in, introduced the clause all right bill isn't we, there also a thing on the listing agreement on the there MLS? Is. yes there's also a FERPTA clause on the yeah. so that's yeah. that's your first yeah. clue all right all right bill hey we really uh, appreciate your time thank, thank you yeah, this is awesome. this is great very uh and, yeah and, and bill uh, what is your position at american title I was CFO at this point. I am now a project manager. We're going to new software, so I'm going to lead that team. Yeah. So, so my point is, I apologize. We didn't include your title in your present oh, in the no. initial introduction. Um, but I've, again, I want everybody to understand he's he's exceptionally he qualified to about. talk right, about right, this. Right. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. all right, Bill, appreciate it. Yeah, thank uh, you. All right, so Bob's not here, so I'll do my best. <laughs> don't do don't that. Do that. Don't do that. <laughs> All right, so that's don't do that with Bob. He's gonna if he if he hears this, he's gonna kill that's me. It. It's <laughs> over. You're not getting a hamburger next. All right, week. leave you with the quote of the day from uh, a guy whose last name I can't pronounce, but I can't pronounce his first name. It's Tony. Stop chasing the money and start chasing the passion. We appreciate everybody joining us today. Go out and sell a home. <laughs>